Zero trust, evolving nature that is imperative in our country, the importance of cloud adoption, and the digital framework that exists, all of that and more. Thank you so much, Mr. Samir, for that address. Now we come to the next conversation, which is the cryptography enabling new digitization possibilities, the decade of authentication. To take this forward, the esteemed lineup of speakers that we have, Dr. Ashok Kumar Nanda, Associate Professor, BVRIT, Mr. Ajit Hatti, Founder, Pair ID, who's going to be moderating the session, Professor Prabhakaran, Computer Science and Engineering, Professor IIT Bombay, and Mr. Alan Goh, Sales Engineering, DigiCert. Please put your hands together and with a huge round of applause, welcome our panelists. Yes, let's get you all to come up on stage. Audience, please put your hands together and welcome the panel on stage. Thank you very much. Hi, good evening all. I don't expect an echo back. Uh, <laughs> so uh, feel, feel free to keep mum. Um, so uh, being the last uh, session for today, uh, before the innovation box, uh, we will keep it quick. The problem at hand that we have is uh, discussion on the authentication problem. Because before you avail any service, you have to prove your identity and uh, avail that service, right? Uh, so. Welcome to this uh, last uh, session of FinSec 2023. Uh, the problem we will be discussing for uh, FinTech companies uh, or the FinTech uh, segment. Uh, now, over the decades, financial services or financial institutions have evolved. Uh, earlier, we just go to bank for any kind of financial services, but then we have uh, seen uh, very, very specialized uh, companies coming up uh, to cater to our financial needs, like uh, payment gateways, uh, specific companies like OneCard providing card services, then you have uh, NBFCs, then uh, BNPL companies, right? So all these specialized companies are coming, and then uh, finance itself is changing. It is undergoing a lot of changes, like we have decentralized, deregularized uh, finances as well, right? So finance itself is evolving. Uh, the authentication methods have been evolving. Let's discuss uh, what evolution financial uh, uh, industry has undergone in, in terms of uh, authentication of the users or authentication of the machines. And also we'll see what challenges we have been facing throughout uh, this decade and what are the challenges we have in front, how users are gearing up with those challenges and adopting with the new technologies. Uh, and we'll also see the regula regulators, since we have a lot of people here from regulatory background. So we will uh, just poke at them as well <laughs> by discussing how the regulatory bodies are uh, playing their roles uh, in this game. So uh, I have uh, Prabhakaran, sir, uh, on my left. Uh, Manoj Prabhakaran, uh, he's from IIT Mumbai. I have Ashok, sir, uh, Dr. Ashok, on my right. And my far, on my far right, we have uh, Mr. Allen. Uh, coming right from Melbourne. Uh, so let's start the discussion. Let's uh, go around and see uh, what do you think are the major milestones that uh, uh, financial industries have uh, achieved uh, in, in terms of uh, user authentication or authentication in general. So we can consider authentication in two parts. So first is establishing identity of a user, that is onboarding the user uh, by identity proofing or verifying the user, and then providing the services over uh, various means of authentication. So. Prabhakar, sir. So I, 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 nice to uh, be here. I should start with a disclaimer. I know very little about the uh, finance sector or you know uh, industry in general. What I do know is about cryptography, the you know the uh, technology that goes behind uh, enabling authentication, and um, you know. In, you coming from a cryptographer's point of view, probably wouldn't just think of authentication uh, by itself. You kind of need to think of authentication along with what it's used for, what happens after that. Uh, for instance, you know, you establish a channel, you know, you authenticate and you establish a secure channel with the person you have authenticated. Um, but, you know, kind of clearly uh, certain technologies like digital signatures have been key to uh, enabling all sorts of things. And you know, we take it for granted today, but 
before the 80s, there was no digital signature, right? Um, there were, there was, uh, you know, communication, electronic computers, whatever, but there was no digital signatures until it was invented, and um, it's one of those magical things that, um, you know, uh, needn't have been there, but thankfully, we live in a world where it exists. And um, same with public key encryption, um, you know, that we take for granted, but um, in a certain sense, if the way computational hardness, how the mathematics of all that um, felt, to, you know, came together, um, it was entirely possible these things needn't have been there. You know. So, um, so okay. So, you know, the the mathematics has you know given us certain tools. Now, we have uh, you know used a lot of them. Um, I'm sure you know Ajit and others you know have built a lot of you know, new creative technology on top of those basic tools. One thing I feel, so that's good, you know, that's in some sense, now it's a fairly mature technology. A lot of things are, um, you know, going well as they should be. Of course, there are a lot of other things which are not going well, maybe, you know, bugs in the software, there are a lot of um, leakages, what are, those issues are still there. But one thing I feel maybe going forward would be to go beyond these very basic encryption and authentication tools and take it to the next level because in theory we know a lot more you know we have a lot more tools that uh, uh, cryptography has in store for us and to translate them into applications into um, you know services take some more effort and i think that's probably the next step i, I probably am not answering your question of what has happened so far it kind of you know what has happened so far is great you know these uh, um, uh, technologies like digital signatures and public key encryption have been put to good use, but I feel like not enough, right, has been done given what we know in theory. A lot of those things have not yet translated into practice. So that's kind of where we are is my take on it. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, or maybe I'm answering a question that will come later. <laughs> So from the cryptography standpoint, uh, yeah, uh, digital signature is one of the most uh, thing that we uh, use or apply uh, whenever we have to verify the documents, etc. All my ITRs have been signed by the digital signatures, right? And uh, we use uh, CAs like DigiCert and all to provide those uh, signatures. So that is that has been one of the uh, significant, uh, uh, what you can say, uh, a block uh, in uh, authenticating uh, the documents, etc., or establishing. Uh, the verified uh, verification of the documents uh, to trust that and carry out the uh, business, right? So that is, yeah, definitely one important thing. And uh, cryptography does from the from the rock bed of the trust, right? Or it provides the verifiability. Uh, there is nothing that you can trust, but yeah, at least it provides you the verifiability, right? Uh, so uh, from digital signature, I would like to move on to uh, Ashok sir. Uh, what you think are the major contribution of the cryptography in terms of authentication for fintech space? Authentication, authentication point of view, we have to go for the uh, secure communication, most important, and uh, secure access control also required. Then secure digital identification also required for the and. Uh, secure uh, communi communications. Next is privacy protection that also required. Then blockchain and uh, distributed ledger technology also be needed. Then IoT security also nowadays is more demand, so it, I think this is also. Right, so um, as, as you have mentioned, uh, identity verification. So uh, yeah, we have seen a lot of identity frauds happening and affecting FinTech, banking services, et cetera. Now talking about identity frauds, just to put some stats, uh, because that's a trend in all the panels, we have to discuss some stats, so let's do that. Okay, so, um, uh, uh, when we see the damages done to uh, these financial institutions in terms of identity fraud, so what has been seen is the banks are affected more than any fintech companies. So uh, the bank, for banks, the damage is around half a million dollar in an incident, uh, identity fraud incident. 
and for fintech uh, it is around 128k okay and uh, the tech companies or aviation industry is somewhere in between it's 250k okay so this is a study by uh, healthnet security you can you can check that online okay so banks are impo uh, impacted more with the identity frauds than the fintech companies okay now uh, what we have seen is fintech companies modern companies faster in adoption okay uh, of uh, of new uh, new technologies right uh, and uh, uh, the harbinger of new technologies are the CAs who are providing the basic framework for uh, adopting these uh, uh, cryptography-based services. Okay, so I would like to come to Alan and uh, check his views uh, about uh, how fintech companies are consuming CA services for uh, uh, putting trust in most of the things that they are doing. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm from DigiCert. DigiCert is the largest digital trust um, CA in the world. Um, what we are seeing now is that um, the, in the finance sector, basically, they are really embraced into the concept of digital trust. Digital trust, in, in a way, is, is not just about visiting the website, you trust the website, but you trust the, the machine that is connected to the network as well. When you say you trust the machine, meaning that before I trust the machine, the machine must have an uh, identity. You know, who, what is this machine, right? It's easy to give a digital certificate to the website, right? I just verify the website, I give you the digital certificates. But for, for machine, uh, there is also, we, we, we can do that in a way whereby we also give them the G digital certificates and it's embedded into the machines. Uh, not only machines, we are also seeing uh, a lot of finance sectors, the DevOps teams, they are actually start signing the code, the software, the software that they develop in-house. You give an uh, identity or maybe you give, I would say, a digital signature on the software itself. So when the software have a malware, stuff like that, we know that this is, this is signed by who? or who actually author the, 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 the software, basically. So, so remember, it's not just about um, cryptography, signature, but it's really about the identity as well on the website, on the uh, machines, and on the software, basically. So that, that is the trend that we are seeing. Everything has to be trusted. But we don't care whether you are a human, or a machine, or a software. Yeah, that, that is the, the current. Okay, so you mean to say uh, when it comes to digital identities, you don't differentiate between humans and the computers, right? Or machines. You, you have to verify them with the proper yes. certificate. Yes. Okay, okay, fine. So now this, uh, from a user perspective, we have to think it in different, different ways because users carry different risks uh, because users are accessing their digital services from various devices, various networks, right? So the risk for users and their machines is different from uh, if suppose uh, a fintech company has multiple servers with, and those are communicating with each other. They are residing in a sanitized environment. So risk for them is totally different from risk what humans have. They might get fish, etc. Right? So uh, yeah. So we when when we are seeing as a user, uh, we see that threats uh, have to be seen in different perspective. But yeah, as far as CAs are concerned, yeah, you you feel that. Yeah, everyone should have a valid certificate, right? And authentication should be through certificates. Yes, because uh, as, as, as what we do a survey, basically, that, um, that is important is that uh, everyone need to have an identity, basically. And, and the customer leave you, leave, leave, leave a bank if something happened to the bank, right? Because you, maybe your system got hacked, ATM doesn't come up with the money, stuff like that. But people lose the trust. Correct. Identity actually gives a trust element to 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 a person, basically. Correct. Correct. So uh, losing losing trust, I will just uh, come to you. So when it when we talk about losing trust, so what what has been seen is uh, whenever there is an identity fraud, okay, uh, to ba banks or financial industries, so um, the disruption cost uh, is uh, around forty four percent. Whatever costs they bear uh, for the disruption or the identity fraud, 44% uh, is for the disruption, and 36% is the legal fees which they have to incur to uh, fight that incident or uh, take care of that incident. Right. So, 
so much of value is put into, uh, or so much of money is put into uh, managing the reputational damage or the disruption, right? So uh, we have to discuss the attacks and the countermeasures for that, right? Uh, but yeah, I would like to take your take and then. Yeah, so something, something to kind of follow up on that and what uh, Alan was saying. Uh, you know, there is kind of, uh, to kind of maybe repeat myself, there's sheer magic in digital signatures, right? Uh, in that, you know, uh, so compare it with something like using your fingerprint for uh, identification. The problem with fingerprints, there are at least a couple of problems. One is that there's not enough randomness in there. Like you could, you know, uh, over time find out somebody's fingerprint fully. And secondly, when you are um, giving your fingerprint as authentication, you're actually revealing that secret that's supposed to be there. So it kind of, the security is kind of based on the fact that, oh, maybe nobody can, it's not that nobody can know your fingerprint, it's more like nobody can put it on their fingers, hopefully, then, um, you know, pass it off as their own fingerprint. Um, whereas with digital signatures, it's a private key you're storing, everybody knows your public key, and still, you know, even, even if you give out many, many signatures, you're signing key is just as secure as it was in the beginning. So there is, you know, there is that aspect of uh, cryptography that's missing when you're using biometrics. On the other hand, uh, one more thing about, you know, good thing about cryptography is that um, you can revoke your signing keys. You know, something, you know, you, it gets stolen, your uh, phone gets hacked or whatever, you can get it changed. Whereas with fingerprints, you know, you're stuck with your fingerprint, right? You cannot ch get it changed or your iris, whatever. But uh, on the other hand, uh, it comes with certain uh, overheads, right? You need to have a device. You cannot just memorize your signing key. You need to have a computing device that can compute it for you. You are subject to you know, malware or whatever that might steal your keys that, you know, without you realizing it. So there is a certain, and you need public infrastructure that you know, DigiCert and others have so painfully created for us. Um, so you, you rely on a certain amount of, um, you know, overhead, or you need to live with a certain amount of overhead. Um, so it's not like, you know, there is a, uh, a, uh, an easy, you know, good solution. Everything comes with a cost. There is a good balance of, you know, you could have multi-factor authentication. You could have things like smart cards, which are somewhere between, you know, having uh, your fingerprint or having a computational device, right? Instead, you can just have your signing key on your on a smart card, at least for situations like you're authenticating yourself to an ATM, hmm. you can certainly go with uh, you know, a, a digital uh, signature-based solution. So um, yeah, so uh, you know, identity fraud, when you're completely relying on things like fingerprints or biometrics, I think it, it is a problem. The identity theft is hard to, um, uh, you know, once it happens, it's hard to recover from. Whereas with um, you know, just a cryptographic solution, there are overheads, it's expensive, everybody has to have a smart card or whatever. Um, maybe you know, the industry would find or has been finding uh, good balances between you know, usability and uh, security. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm not sure if that was... Uh, so I will, I will give you the perspective. So in India, what happens is, so um, uh, Manoj Prabhakaran, sir, has worked extensively in US, uh, and uh, recent times he is working in India. And since Alan has came from Melbourne, I will put some perspective. So here in India, most of the fintechs, uh, they onboard users based on their Aadhaar. Aadhaar is a national identity. Uh, so, and uh, we, uh, uh, any, any, uh, any bank or any fintech, when they onboard a user on their platform, uh, they will take their Aadhaar number, uh, and government has a central repository of the uh, user's biometrics, that is fingerprint, et cetera. And then uh, you have to present your biometrics to verify. And then there is a phone-based verification. So an SMS is sent on phone. Uh, when you uh, submit that SMS, it means you are giving a consent for your verification, Aadhaar verification. So your Aadhaar is verified based uh, with your consent. And then you present your biometrics, okay? And then you are verified. And also, uh, some companies might take your photograph if you are procuring a SIM card, et cetera. So that is jumping out of FinTech segment. But yeah, when you uh, uh, are availing banking service, they also take your photograph. And that is also maybe a face matching is also happening. Okay, And then, the, uh, the then you are onboarded. And then uh, you are eligible for accessing the services which uh, these companies are providing. Now, as you said, that biometrics has its own issue, right? And uh, 
uh, you can you said that uh, keys can be revoked but your biometrics cannot right so and here we are using combination of biometrics and here in india we are not very very privacy aware or uh, uh, we don't try to shield our privacy a lot yeah, in right. fact, yeah, just to kind of uh, follow up on that, um, you know, Aadhaar at some point, maybe due to pressure from uh, privacy advocates, introduced this thing called virtual ID, right? Right. No service that, you know, I've been trying to use recently, they accept this virtual ID. They need the 12-digit Aadhaar and not the 16-digit virtual correct, ID. Correct, correct. Their, you know, forms don't accept the 16 digits, right? So, yeah, so even when there has been some, you know, effort to uh, grant some privacy, right, the point there is to avoid uh, tracking pe people across services. If you're using the same other everywhere, in principle, you know, these you know, people could get together, the different service providers could get together and see that, oh, you're using, you're the same person using all these things. And there's no need for that, them to realize that or to mine that kind of data. Uh, so it's, yeah, the, the privacy, could be much better, the privacy. Yeah, yeah. So so um, uh, th there are a few companies, uh, they are very uh, doing very good job. Like we have one Cosmos here who onboard users after uh, doing a thorough identity proofing of the user and then they give their authentication service. Okay. Uh, so, so FinTech are fast adopting and there are many companies who are providing these services. Now, uh, they are again using, making use of blockchains, right? Like we are using digital signatures, et cetera. Now, what do you think are the threats when we are heavily relying uh, so, yeah, biometrics, clearly that has threat, and recent times there were attacks on Android-based phone where they can brute force your fingerprints, right? And I'm sure deep fakes will come, they can mimic your voice and they can mimic your faces, right? And your facial expressions or moves, right? So that can be done. Uh, but yeah, as far as cryptography is concerned, what challenges, because we feel uh, biometrics are still probabilistic, they might match, there might be some error, but cryptography, we see it as very deterministic, right? Uh, so. What do you think still there are some challenges with cryptography and what, what we can do over there? Um, one thing that, um, that is a very hot topic today uh, in the world basically is the, um, the PQC. Uh, I think post quantum, -quantum crypto yeah. basically. Now, uh, just, just to give some updates, uh, whereby I think um, last year NIST US has. Um, has selected four algorithm uh, for the PQC. All right. Existingly, we have basically the two popular one, RSA and ECC uh, algorithm. Last year, US and IST have selected four. Three for encryptions, one for uh, digital nature, basically. Now, what is next uh, is IETF. Now, it's, it's going to IETF. IETF, as you know, is, is, is the global standard uh, for internet protocol. So now they are studying that. That is important um, because when the PQC machine, you know, a quantum machine come out, it will basically break everything. Uh, as you know, cryptography is the, is the key to the trust of what we do today, basically. You know, we trust everything based on the authentications, you know, machine. Um, we still have time, I think. Um, we still have time. Um, the best thing I would say is to start um, doing the uh, crypto uh, inventory. You, I don't know how about India here, but start doing the crypto inventory. Know where is your what asset you have that is using crypto, and um, what versions you have. So when the thing come, I think you, you, you guys will be more ready, basically. Right. Okay. So now we, we are talking about uh, post-quantum scenarios, right? Uh, so we are talking uh, in future, uh, we want to shield ourselves from the future attacks, right? But here, uh, the, uh, if, if we talk about the current security scenarios, okay, uh, I will just want to uh, quote an example and get maybe audience views as well. So how many of you use uh, SBI bank services? SBI customers, do you love their security? Their security is so, so paranoid settings that using the service is hard, very, very hard, right? So they have very, very paranoid settings, right? So yeah, I mean, we can go on increasing the security, but then again, uh, we have to see how user uh, is open to adopt that, that kind of security or harshness of that security because security does come at prices. Now, when you uh, talk about uh, quantum agility or uh, quantum safe cryptography, right? 
uh, I'm sure it's not easy to implement, right? We have to prepare for that, yes. Uh, but yeah, I, I would like to take, uh, Ashok sir, your views. <laughs> uh, yes. what, what are the challenges what there? I am adding to some points, uh, along with the Mr. Alwin, that uh, one is a brute force attack also be one of the important. Uh -huh. Side channel attack also be there, and uh, social engineering and piecing, malware exploitations, and uh, already he covered quantum, so I do not want to say. But these are the most important, so we have to consider for the attacks point of view. Correct, totally agree. I mean, even yes, before sir. we think of quantum, social engineering, right? Uh, yeah, and brute forcing, etc. These yes, are sir. these are very very real threats that we are facing. And DDoS. Yeah, DDoS. Yeah, financial institution do do uh, uh, face uh, DDoS attacks. <coughs> Sorry. So so uh, in in noon, Lakshmi was presenting uh, that uh, th uh, their company was seeing attacks at. Uh, airports, et cetera, and then uh, they would able to thwart those attacks, DDoS attacks uh, on uh, the airport, uh, air, few airports, then they move to banks and uh, medical institutions. So yeah, that's a, that's a very uh, uh, potent threat to, <laughs> to our industry. Uh, but then uh, if, if at all we have to, uh, like uh, since we all are from cryptography background and uh, that's what we um, <clears throat> we are on our sleeves. So if we have to uh, give some advice to community on uh, uh, safe computing and safe use of cryptography, uh, what is your quick advice? If I would like to, uh, if I uh, can go in around and take your advices, so. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I guess the standard advice is don't roll your own cryptography, you know, use uh, well-tested libraries or, you know, products, not to say that they will all be good and safe, but at least it will be safer than what you would const you know, do yourself in a, in, a, uh, in your company or startup, right? So TLS 1.3 has new cipher suits. It has Chacha and uh, yeah, that, that's Chacha fine. 105. Like, yeah, TLS 1.3 you know, is as good as so all the new you know, ciphers, are as good as anything else in the sense that it's you know, vetted by the security community, by the cryptography community. So they are OK, you know, of course. Anything could be broken in principle, but um, that may be okay, right? I'm, I'm not saying don't adopt the new standards. Standards, want, you know, they become standards. They become standards usually for a reason. You would be safe. To yeah, use because that. there are some public scanners. If I uh, scan my bank site with that, then it might show uh, the lower ranking because it, the banks are not supporting the new ciphers as of now. So, do you think that bank should rush on, or the NBFC should rush on the new ciphers and start supporting it? Even those uh, yeah, are I'm experimental. Not, I'm not, I don't know, but uh, I, I would think it's not critical. But you know, if you are losing out customers who only have somehow enabled the new ciphers, then you might want to support them. But um, maybe it's not a uh, it, it, uh, from a. It's a more a usability question, I would say. Okay. Okay. If, so uh, I, I will. Huh. So, so just to kind of comment on the uh, what Ashok was also saying. Yeah, the, you know, given all the other threats, quantum is probably not something you, as a user of security or cryptography you should be worried about, right? If and when necessary, there will be updated standards, there will be you know, tools that uh, the cryptographic uh, protocols that will be quantum resistant. And, but more like what Alan was saying, the uh, crypt, you know, agility, the crypt, building a cryptographic inventory and, you know, uh, keeping track of the software that you're using, the versions and so forth. That's important for its own reasons, right? Uh, you could uh, you need to make sure you're, uh, there is some attack on, not because of quantum, but you know, things do get broken once in a while. There'll be some bugs and so forth. You need to get them fixed. So that's still important. Quantum, you know, maybe not something for you to worry about. Okay, cool. Thanks. So yeah, I was going back to Alan. So uh, CAs, right? CAs come with boundaries. So CA belongs to some country. And what we have seen is uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine uh, conflicts, uh, and uh, Russia was sanctioned. Uh, so all the CAs distrust, uh, distrusted their certificates. So uh, yeah, Russian sites, uh, services weren't accessible because their certificates were uh, not trusted. Right now, all the CAs are from NATO countries. And they form an alliance, right? So do we need uh, CAs without borders so that if, if, let's say, if a country like ours has some conflict with conflict of interest with other countries and they, they don't put a collective sanctions and none of our digital services are working, right? So do we need uh, CAs without borders? 
Yes? No? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So what do, you, what do you think as a CA from this conflict, um, geopolitic conflict? I can comment, but I, this is my own comment. I won't be representing my, my on behalf of DigiCert. But what I think is that um, the world has to come together, basically. You need to have a standard, right? A standard to verify a website, a standard to verify a, 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 a email, email standard, a standard to verify a code signing, basically. You, you need to have a standard. I know it's hard. It's hard to do cryptography uh, when the standard is changing, but, uh, but we still have to do it, basically. Uh, I know the bank here, a lot of bank here, but uh, cryptography can be difficult if you want to find, uh, if you want to do a crypto inventory, or maybe you want to uh, implement your crypto agility. So, but I, think, I know it's hard, but you just have to do it. Um, PQC, yes, it's, 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 it's maybe far away or yes. it's near, but last... Let's, yeah. let's be ready, I think. Yeah, yeah. so as you ready. said, cryptography is hard, but we have to do that hard thing, right? Yeah. So, yeah, Ashok, sir, how, why, why cryptography is still hard? So we have so many esteemed institutes around here uh, and esteemed uh, professors like you, right? And still, cryptography is hard. So where, where is the gap? So actually, I'm talking, uh, presently I'm talking about that uh, scenario. Most of students in CSE, they are going for the AML data science. If you compare to cyber security, the number is very less, cyber security. And if you go about cryptography, if you institute, uh, hardly you'll get two, three members or maximum five students. That too, they are very much scared about mathematics and they are uh, number theory there. So I appeal to here the forum that uh, here many industry people are there, the, that you choose the best institute as uh, Prabhakaran sir is from IIT, of course, every people will look towards IIT, but uh, in your locality, whatever the institutes are there, I request to all industry people and the uh, banking sector, identify your premier institute and the professors, two, three professors, you collaborate and you do some assignments like USA, that uh, industry will come forward for the supporting some kind of the research activities. I hope that uh, we will come out from that because uh, India is very, very uh, slow and lagging in terms of cryptography, design and modifications, implementation point of view. So that's why I'm requesting all the audience here on forum, please, we have to think about that, how we can get good algorithm and design point of view, implementation point of view, so that we can come out in future. That is a main message. Thank you, Ashok sir. Uh, we uh, we are uh, we have exhausted the time. Thanks a lot. Yeah, point taken that there is there exists a gap. Academia uh, is working in silos. Industry doesn't care much about cryptographic security. They have many other things to think of, right? Uh, DSCI and especially Vinaksar and his team does a very great job. They they accommodate uh, the cryptographers in DSCI's event so that we can have this discussion. Uh, make you guys aware of the issues that cryptography world has and a lot of uh, 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 skill gap is there uh, in the practitioners, right? Uh, there is OWAS top 10, there is OWAS mobile top 10, but there is no OWAS cryptography top 10, right? It's not there at all, right? So yeah, uh, very, very thankful to the organizers for uh, having this space where we can discuss. Yeah, we can take uh, quick audience questions. Uh, I would like to check with the organizers, do we have time? Uh, and if you have time, no time, yeah. But yeah, if there is a question. I will just take that and wind up. Um, uh, the question is to Professor Prabhakar. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, the identity of the entity, the public key, the private key. And in terms of the requirements, we have uh, um, utility from analytics, AIML, one part. Neither is the security part, neither is the privacy part. So um, these have to coexist. Um, so to maximize all these three attributes that I talked about, utility through analytics and security and privacy, um, is the public key cryptography good enough or uh, is there better alternatives uh, at least to start working on? Yeah, so public key cryptography only goes so far. We, there, but there in, uh, I was mentioning there are theoretical uh, tools out there, like uh, you might have heard of zero knowledge proofs, the secure multi-party computation, there are notions of privacy, like differential privacy. There's a whole lot of you know, uh, potentially useful tools, and some of it are practical, uh, some of it are more theoretical, that 
yeah, could be brought to you know uh, address this uh, uh, functionality versus security trade-off, right? Um, so yeah, there are things. We just need some. Um, we need trained people who are comfortable with theory and practice. We need industry. We need funding. You know, we need uh, uh, yeah to draw students into these areas. And um, I'm sure uh, there's a lot more that can be done. Cool. Thank you all. Uh, we all are here. If you have any questions, you can grab each one of them and uh, get your question answered. Uh, over to Neha or the uh, master of conference. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, my co-panelists. Thank you, panel. It's Shreya. Thank so you. Thank you so much for those insights. New possibilities in cryptography, the changing evolution uh, that the journey of cryptography has had. Thank you very much for all of your insights. Hold on. We have... Thank you, tokens of appreciation coming your way. Can we have a round of applause for our closing plenary that just took place? Lots of very interesting insights and anecdotal references from that conversation.